This is really a pleasure and an honor and a, um, you know, sort of a, a, a poignant nostalgic moment for a number of us to welcome uh, Mark Stevens and Annalyn Swan with us on the, um, to celebrate the, their, their latest book, Francis Bacon Revelations, and also to welcome back our dear friend, Michael Schneerson. So um, we're in for a real treat this afternoon and we've got a, a terrific crowd in the room. And I, I just want to say a moment, for a moment, I, I said poignant and nostalgic because um, there are a number of people on the Zoom who um, had, knew Mark's mother, um, Polly Kraft, who was just a dear friend of so many of ours from Washington to Wayne Scott, where she had a studio, to Sag Harbor, to all sorts of places. She was a fabulous artist in her own right and just a delightful, charming woman. And so I, I feel as if she's sort of with us. And, and Mark, I hope you don't mind my saying that, but I just couldn't not do it because there really are a number of people who could tell Polly stories and, and would love to do so. She would be um, delighted and, and amazed um, that we finished the book. Yeah, I know. I wish she were. I, I did tell it a story a minute ago that I saw Polly a few years ago, um, right, sort of the summer before she died, and she was renting a house in Sag Harbor. A number of you probably remember that. And and Mark wasn't in the house at the time. Annalyn was there, and she was upstairs, and Polly said, don't worry, it'll be soon. She's working on the footnotes. It's almost done, et cetera, et cetera. And so as Mark reminded me, Polly was ever an optimist. So um, anyway, so Mark is a former art critic of New York Magazine. He's been an art critic for the New Republic and Newsweek. He's written for The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and The New York Times. And Annalyn is the former arts editor of Newsweek and an award-winning music critic, which I have to say, I didn't actually know. Um, and she teaches biography at CUNY and also uh, Middlebury's Breadloaf School of English. And most of you, you know, we remember them uh, dearly for de Kooning, their book that in 2005 won the Pulitzer, de Kooning, an American master. And, here they are um, with another brilliant biography. And Michael, who I've said is a friend of ours, and he's been in the store both as a, a host for some events, and we have also hosted him for um, at least a couple of his books. He's become a contributing editor at Vanity Fair that started in 1986, and he's the author of eight books. And um, the one that we remember the most is Boom, Mad Money, Mega Dealers, and the Rise of Contemporary Art. So um, I welcome all of you. And so it's a book that really only I feel that I'm gonna I'm gonna hold it up. It's a it's a stunning book. It's a tome and a really a tour de force. That's a story that's you know masterfully told, masterfully researched, masterfully um, uh, written and it's about a sickly boy. I mean, this is it who became one of the great figures of his time. And I'm just gonna quickly just sort of set the stage because I don't know quite what Michael's gonna say. I was just reading, rereading uh, the review in the Wall Street Journal about this book and now just, it's a paragraph, but let me just do go quickly. It said more than a decade before the end of the Lady Chatterley Van and the Beatles' first LP, the iconoclasm, iconoclasm, that's wrong, I'm sorry, of Francis Bacon announced a new era in British life. By his death in Madrid in 1992, he was a social and artistic icon, his battered face, the image of painterly tradition. Openly gay, he was the king of Soho, a nocturnal drinker and cruiser. His motto, champagne for my real friends, real pain for the sham. Um, by day, alone in his studio, he was the exposer of torn flesh and gaping mouths, of the secret shames and spiritual collapse that in the post-war decades when French thinkers ruled in concert, with French painters made him the only true English existentialism. And it then goes on to say that it's with revelations, Mark and Annalyn bring a sober eye and organizing mind to Bacon's gild, gilded gutter life 
as in their claim to Kooning, the authors frame their subject and his work as a portrait of the age. And so I, I really can't wait. I'm halfway through this book. I can't wait to hear what Mark and Annalyn have to say and Michael in conversation with them. So with that, Michael, I'll hand it over to you. And again, welcome and thank you. Well, thank you. Um, this is a real pleasure for me. Um, uh, Mark's and Annalyn's paths and, and mine have crossed many times in the last decades. Um, uh, more important really, uh, uh, it's what they've done with the Kooning that um, uh, not only won them a Pulitzer, but um, uh, taught a lot of us the whole history of art in the East End. I mean, that's the only book you have to read to know that whole fabulous history. And it's also parenthetically the book that inspired me to write my book, uh, totally. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I want to um, hand this over to them because we, we don't have much time. Uh, I, I want to just... Um, jump in where it seems uh, appropriate, uh, but, but turn, turn the show over to Mark and Annalyn, who, as I understand it, have a very um, impressive and, uh, and detailed screen show. So guys, over to you. I just wanna say one thing though, since we're all reminiscing here and being very good friends, uh, Michael, we were baby writers together way back in the day at Time. Sure. And I wanted to, to remind you and, how impressive it was that when you were the first of all of our bunch to write a biography, it was Irwin Shaw, and I think it was late 80s, was it not? Yes, that's right. That's and then two years <laughs> later, Mark and I embarked on de Kooning. But I remember thinking, wow, and everybody was talking out on the East End about this, this book on Irwin Shaw. And so I think you were the paths you're the pathfinder for all of us. <laughs> well, I'm very sweet of you. He, he was a big figure out here as well. It's true. Anyway, over to you. All right. So should we start the slideshow? Sure, if you think. Um, uh, mm -hmm. or, or, or we could perhaps um, uh, ease into it with, with a question or two. Um, I, I want you to know I read all 700 pages. Um, I finished it about a week ago. I found it as thrilling as de Kooning um, and, uh, you know, uh, fascinating and at the same time, um, you, you know, bewildering how, how this man became all the complex things that define him, um, how he could, you know, go out um, uh, on, a, on a night of rough trade and, uh, and come back in the morning and, and, and work all day. Um, uh, there's, a, um, there's a wonderful uh, quote. I, I, I found myself thinking that you, you probably had a real challenge to delineate those nights of rough trade so notorious to Francis Bacon. And there's a sentence here where you, you write, um, he was attracted to the rough trade he could find a moment's clarity in the sometimes violent serendipity of the night. Now, boy, that's an elegant <laughs> sentence and, uh, and, and one that uh, uh, must have been hard to, to draw out. Um, but the, um, the book is, is marvelous. And, and it, I, I guess early on, it, it, it takes on to a considerable extent the uh, question of why this man, who actually didn't even start as a painter, who started as a designer of, of furniture, of rugs even, um, why he uh, began doing the paintings he did, which as we all know, were so jarring and violent. Um, what demons was he, um, was he combating uh, and, and what led him uh, further and further down that path? Well, I think we'll get into that as we go through the slideshow a bit, because we show kind of the evolution. Let's do that. Okay. But great question. <laughs> well, um, we're going to begin with this charming old photograph, uh, which like many charming old photographs is, um, I don't know, uh, it's perfumed with lies, really. Uh, you can tell that Bacon grew up under very privileged circumstances. In this case, the big houses, the so-called big houses of the Anglo-Irish, where in fact, nothing was more important than a horse. Uh, his mother, who you see here, rode side saddle when she went fox hunting. But the truth was that Bacon's life as a child was emotionally paralyzed, constricted, suffocating, desperate. 
His father was cruel and heartless. His mother was distracted by the social world. The Irish Revolution was just outside the door and Bacon himself was a paralyzingly shy child, um, desperately ill with asthma. He was allergic to horses. Hmm. Have the next slide. Oh yeah, so here, here, Bacon was probably saved, rescued by these two women. Women were very important in his life. Uh, one of the joys of writing this book, in fact, was that he was surrounded from the very beginning by, by just dozens of, of remarkable, strange characters, lively characters. Writing this book was like being inside a Dickens novel. In any case, on the left, you see his, his fabulously rich and eccentric grandmother who uh, saw in the paralyzingly shy Bacon uh, a clever social performer. And she introduced him to the social world and made him feel valued. And because she was so eccentric herself, he thought perhaps, well, maybe I too can be myself. And on the right, you see his nanny, Nanny Lightfoot, who was a working class spirit, mischievous, naughty even a little bit. She was the one who tucked him into bed every night. And she stayed with him to the end of his life in 1951. She even did things like guard the door when he was having illegal gambling parties in London in the 30s and 40s. Next. This is an early portrait of Bacon by someone named Francis Julian Gutman, taken when he was in his early 20s. Uh, <clears throat> this is upon his return to London, a very formative year and a half in Paris. Um, uh, he had gone to the Weimar Republic, uh, Germany, uh, shortly and thereafter spent uh, 14 months in Paris learning French. Uh, he later spoke um, of seeing a Picasso painting at the um, uh, gallery uh, Paul Rosenberg and that that had led him towards his painting career. However, at the time that he was in Paris, what the young Francis Bacon was really doing was learning the craft of design, as Michael mentioned earlier. Um, there was a famous Eileen Gray architect and designer at the time. He fell under her spell. She had a, a wonderful ultra-modern studio called Jean Désert. Um, he also came under the uh, tutelage of Madge Garland, the uh, lesbian former uh, fashion editor of British Vogue who'd been fired for being gay. Uh, but she had a great uh, coterie of friends in Paris. So he was part of that world, uh, which he strove mightily to hide in his later years. And by the way, um, uh, Bacon's first important lover in his life, an older gentleman named Eric Alden, wrote in his diary upon meeting Francis Bacon that he was almost too pretty to be a boy. Hmm. Next. This is the culmination of his design career, uh, a 1930 show at his 17 Queens Queensberry Muse studio. Um, it was a, a great sensation at the time. Madge Garland uh, wrote a, a, a very influential piece uh, called the 1930 Look in British Decoration um, that showed this, this, that showed the, in fact, this very setup. Um, and it looked at that point that Bacon was gonna be off and running on a design career. Um, as I said earlier, he strove mightily to uh, completely deep six this in later life because he was so embarrassed about the thought he'd ever been a designer. Next. This is interesting uh, because it's the first success in his painting career, a crucifixion from 1933. Um, we talk about it as a, um, as a sort of a, uh, an homage to Picasso and in fact, in a book of the time, an art, a, a very influential art book of the time, uh, the uh, author Herbert Reed, the influential critic, positioned this early Bacon crucifixion across the page from a uh, Picasso crucifixion. Can you imagine anything uh, more stimulating to a young uh, artist? Uh, and of course, it shows very Picasso-esque features. But at the same time that we write, um, it does have, while the stretched out limbs and tiny head of the Christ figure about Picasso's Dinar series, the X-ray ghostliness was something new. So this was shown at a very fashionable and new gallery called the Freddie May Gallery, just launched uh, in 1933 in London's Mayfair. Included in the book, Sir Michael Sadler, one of the great collectors of the time, purchased this for his collection and then even uh, commissioned Bacon to do a uh, rather strange, it turned out, self-portrait. 
So it would appear that Bacon would be off and running on a, 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 his second career as, as an artist, but then everything blew up. Next. Uh, this is a portrait of Eric Hall, who was Bacon's most important early lover. He was an older man, a war hero, married, and an important London politician. Uh, he was Bacon's lover for almost two decades, and he appears to be, in this portrait, two different things, which is often true of closeted men. He appears to be a buttoned-up Tory, perfectly dressed, except look at the flocked velvet wallpaper behind him. Hall had a Baroque, pleasure-loving inner life. He loved to gamble, he loved to drink, he loved to eat well, while being very sober and respectable on the surface. He was a man of secrets and he taught Bacon a great deal. Next. This is the lodge at Bedale School in Petersburg, uh, Petersville, Hampshire, about 60 miles northwest of London, where Bacon spent two formative years during World War II. Early on in the war, he volunteered to be a Red Cross driver, and then at some point volunteered for the air raid precautions, the home defensive unit. That put him on the front lines when the Blitz began in September of 1940. The dust was horrendous for an asthmatic. So his lover, Eric Hall, rented this house at the Dales for him to get away. It was here during the next two years that Bacon read deeply, soaked up the images of war from the Picture Post magazine, and his darkly nihilistic vision began to take shape in images that he painted on fiberboard. They would eventually lead to his groundbreaking three studies for figures at the base of a crucifixion. Next. Uh, so this is Bacon's breakthrough painting, triptych actually, that he painted in 1944. It's exhibited right towards the end of the war in 1945, and it absolutely shocked London when it appeared. Uh, there's many things to be said about this painting, but I'll just mention two. One is that vile, vile orange color. You cannot imagine how horrible it would have looked to, to English people uh, at the end of the war. They wanted nothing more than to retire to a dusty gray drawing room, really, and relax. And here is this orange that insists upon flame, fire, bombing, and the interruption of regular life. Um, the other thing I'd mention is, well, these are very good monsters, as you can see. They seem to be um, entirely mouth, no eyes, uh, quite, quite charming as monsters go, really. But the middle one is the, is the really, really powerful one. He is like your disagreeable uncle who is going to come and, and talk to you just when you don't want to be talked to anymore at Thanksgiving. He is not going to let you alone. And again, the English at the end of the war, what they wanted to do was to blame Germans, blame fascists, to be left alone in their drawing room. And here is this guy. He's looking at you as if you are a relative. You are not a part. You are not different. You cannot escape. You're human. You're implicated. Next. Uh, this is uh, Head One from 1948, and in this amazing picture, you can see uh, basically the face sliding off uh, the tradition of English portraiture. All those beautiful paintings, all those fancy pictures, all those beautiful country house paintings, here the face is sliding off the head to reveal a rather poignant animal kind of creature inside, half human, half animal. Bacon was interested in ripping the mac mask off of superficial appearances. And here he does so in a, in a very, uh, very uh, unusual way. We look at that, that line that you see attached to the ear. The, the line seems to be releasing the face from the head. It's very taut, but what's it attached to? What power it must have, but we don't know what that power is. So in the book, we call it uh, the most abstract line in English art. Next. So this is the one and only Muriel Belcher, the queen of the Colony Room Club in Soho. So in December of 1948, she was uh, taken to this brand new club uh, by the dissolute uh, British poet Brian Howard, who said, come along, there's this, this brand new club I have to take you to. Uh, during the war, all the clubs had been underground and you know, very much just a word of mouth. But Muriel decided to open something different. She was going to have a club where uh, all the dissolutes of, of, uh, of London, not just Brian Howard, could come. And it was on the second floor 
Um, the decor was of the colonies, the original decor of like bamboo, you know, uh, Bermuda, Bahamas, you know, what have you. Uh, but that was very quickly swept aside. It became just the place where everyone went um, before dinner um, it, it, of a London evening. Uh, and Muriel was a, a very caustic lesbian. She presided over the club from a stool by the door. She had a ma machine gun chatter as one colony goer described it. And she delighted in evicting people that she didn't like. Members only, dearie, and get a facelift on your way, she would, <laughs> she would say from her perch on a stool by the bar. Belter offered Bacon unlimited champagne uh, if he brought in interesting people plus a, t a 10 pounds a week of wage. She was wagering, of course, on Bacon becoming famous and bringing in, you know, the two art world. She was absolutely right about that. The two became instant friends and uh, remained friends until Muriel's death decades later. Next. So this is, uh, I guess, the, the the, the grandest of the early uh, Francis Bacon paintings. It's a painting study after Velasquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X. Um, it depicts a purple robed Pope sitting on a regal throne of gold, but with his mouth wide open in a scream, while dark striated black lines that flow from the top to the bottom of the painting seem to rain down some form of horror from the heavens above. This was the culmination of Bacon's first famous series of screaming popes of the early 1950s, still probably the most famous of all of Bacon's series. Bacon later disavowed his pope paintings, but his friend and devoted critic David Sylvester noted how evocative they were of old master paintings. Sylvester wrote that 1953, the year that this was painted, was the end of Bacon's first great period, that of his head series, and of his Pope paintings. Next. Uh, so here is where the real love and sex starts in the book. Um, this is Peter Lacey. This is the love of Bacon's life. Uh, he was a, a remarkable person who was terribly thwarted. Bacon, when he spoke of love, always tended to put it in scare quotes as if it was a, a fraud, a con, a you're being taken advantage of. But he was actually, in fact, very susceptible to falling in love, especially to this man. He said about Peter Lacey that even his calves were beautiful. Um, one of the joys of writing this book was to, was to rediscover Peter Lacey because he's been caricatured in the past as a sadomasochistic kind of freak who uh, beat up Bacon and was a fighter pilot, which he was not. Uh, all these kinds of exaggerations. And what we tried to do is discover the real meaning in the relationship. Yes, there was violence. Uh, yes, these were two troubled people, but they absolutely adored each other, and we found the evidence to, uh, to prove that. Um, their relationship was very troubled, but it ended only with Lacey's death in 1962 on the eve of Bacon's great retrospective. Next. This is called Two Figures, 1953, and it shows two men having sex, almost certainly Bacon and Lacey. It's in a, set in a dark and blurry atmosphere. It's an iconic portrayal of homosexual passion. I don't know if there's a better or more important one. It could not be exhibited in 1953 when it was made. Um, Lucian Freud, who was not homosexual to say the least, uh, loved this painting and kept it over his own bed until the end of his life. Freud certainly would have admired the um, well, the paint handling, the composition, the mysterious ribbon-like things, the, the way that the whites gleam and pick out edges. He would have admired all that sort of thing. And sort of see in Freud's labor that feeling for the flesh coming through. But the remarkable thing to me, really remarkable, is the expression on the lower figure's face, which combines tenderness and ferocity. Next. So this is Bacon in Tangier with Joseph Dean, the proprietor of Dean's Bar, which was uh, very, very popular with all the expat crowd in Tangier. Tangier is a sort of overlooked uh, about four year period in Bacon's life. Um, and it all revolves around Peter Lacey still. But what happened is that in 1954, they had a tremendous breakup. And I mean, just practically blood bloodbath. And off goes Peter Lacey. Uh, he never wants to see Bacon again. Uh, Bacon was crushed 
Um, so much to his surprise, a telegraph arrived in 1956 from Lacey, who had located, relocated down to Tangier. And Lacey asked if he would care to join him there. Well, Bacon was just so overwhelmed with happiness that he uh, requested loans from Robert Sainsbury and his wife, Lisa, whose, whose portraits he was then painting, got on the first plane he possibly could to go down to Tangier. And they reunited there uh, problematically, of course. They could never live together or never live apart. They just couldn't manage to make their love work. Um, but it, for four years, Bacon was very much a presence in Tangier. So he got to um, go read about, interview this wonderful expatriate community that existed there. And Joseph Dean's bar was where Peter Lacey played the piano. Uh, and at the end, he was drinking more than two bottles of whiskey a day. Um, you know, you can't possibly do this. It was kind of a sad but exotic moment in Bacon's life. Next. Uh, so we were just talking about Tangier. Well, this proves that Bacon, for Bacon, uh, life was not a beat for sure. This is his most difficult painting, I think, by far. Um, Anlin refuses to look at it even. Uh, it forces that it was painted, well, it was painted in, in two weeks right before his, his, his 1962 Tate retrospective in London, which really projected him into the mainstream of 20th century art. Um, again, there's many, many things to say about this. I think it, what it is essentially doing is it forces us to confront the idea of human sacrifice, 20th century style. Uh, in the central panel, the difficult panel, you see the sacrifice itself. And what's so disturbing about that blood-soaked figure on the, on the bed is that it's painted with a kind of delirious pleasure, which is reminiscent of bloodlust. Almost. It's this uh, strange ferocity and, and, and intensity that, uh, that rings true. On the side panels, on the right, you see a, a reflection of a Shimabui crucifixion, uh, medieval, uh, except that it's upside down and you can see the ribs and there's that curious little shadow on the right, which is a cartoonish, comical shadow, I think. At Bacon, there was always comedy lingering around the edges of Bacon too, which is a great thing to do in tragedy. On the left, I think you see his view of critics uh, or people who are, who are wise men talking about sacrifice and difficulty in the world. And you can see uh, the one on the left, the way he's his, his sort of humped over, you know, that's sort of what intellectuals sometimes do when they're about to emit something important, they're about to say something. But you see these bones flaring out from him at the same time. So you can see what Bacon finally thought of all of that. And they're looking, but not really looking at the central problem, the human sacrifice in the center. Next. Uh, this is Bacon's uh, studio, uh, which he founded in the early 60s at Reese Muse, this very famous place. Anlin was talking to you earlier about, um, about that perfect room, that perfect modernist room he made. When Bacon was young, he dreamed of reinventing the Western room, metaphorically, uh, symbolically. Um, he never gave up that dream, except that he changed his view, clearly. This is what he thinks after two world wars, what, what the Western, uh, Western room announced to. And as it could be a Cro-Magnon cave, it could be a monk's cell, it could be an eccentric idiot's uh, backwater flat, it could be anything. Uh, except that it's also stagey. Bacon was a theatrical man, and this is one of the great existential stage sets of the 20th century. Once you see this room with the mirror in the background, you see, um, the broken mirror, uh, you really can't forget it. Next. Now this hands down one of my top five favorite uh, Francis paintings uh, for two reasons. One is that, uh, you know, Bacon was one of the great portraitists of the 20th century, which is sort of forgotten in the face of all his grand triptychs, which tend to get all of the, the attention and publicity. But um, he, he was a wonderful portraitist and he began um, painting portraits primarily in the 1960s from then on. Self-portraits as his friends died off, uh, but he loved to paint certain uh, people. He would return to them again and again. He never wanted sitters. He wanted to know the person from the inside out. And you could always tell who the person was that Francis Bacon was painting because he knows them so well. In this case, it's uh, one of his uh, dearest uh, women friends of whom he had a number, which is often overlooked. This is Isabel Rothstorn, 
a painter who had once been the toast of France. Uh, she was the mistress of Giacometti uh, and part of the whole uh, 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 sort of uh, Paris Parisian intelligentsia um, literary world. She then moved to London where she and Bacon were in very close touch. Um, she had a very commanding presence. And here she is in a 1967 large painting, not one of the small portraits. And it's called uh, Isabel standing in a, a portrait of Isabel Rossort standing in a street in Soho. She's sort of looking over her left shoulder as if at her adoring minions. Uh, Bacon has positioned her within one of his space frames, which he often used to accentuate the most important elements of his painting. Behind her, a car is incongruously turning into a bull. Uh, Bacon loved bulls, you know, figures of uh, obviously animals of power, blood, and speed. And so here a car is turning into the bull. Um, Bacon went on to paint Isabel Rothorn about another 16 times. Uh, he also painted Henrietta Morris, um, who was a model, uh, a sort of artist model for him a number of times as well. Next. So this is uh, Bacon out on the town with George Dyer, who was the cockney lover that uh, came into his life after Peter Lacey's death. Pardon my inquisitive cat. <laughs> um, uh, Bacon loved to dress up George, uh, who was a, a, a wonderful, a, ineffectual, very bumbling uh, thief and East Ender. The, the great legend was that uh, uh, George Dyer fell through the skylight in Bacon's um, studio that Mark just showed you, and Bacon, never missing a beat, said, oh, well, I'm going to report you to the police unless you go to bed with me immediately. Um, alas, the real story was much more prosaic. They met in a uh, sort of Tony uh, homosexual bar near Harrods. But uh, George was indeed an East End Cockney, a very, very bad criminal, as Lucian Ford always said. He just couldn't seem to get anything right. Nonetheless, he stayed with Bacon uh, and became a great model for Bacon, one of the very few live models that Bacon ever had. Uh, he could sit for hours and they would go out on the town and Bacon would also enjoy going with him to the East End of London. Next. Um, I feel like we're going on a bit here, so I'm going to rush this one. Bacon had much more range as an artist than he's usually given credit for. This is George Dyer on a bicycle, an utterly charming painting, I think, that the, crit the critic John Russell said that called this a portrait of the English everyman, which is a nice, nice touch, I think. Next. Now this is Francis Bacon, uh, at a, the, probably the most important retrospective of his career at the Grand Palais in Paris in 1971. Wonderful dinner after the private view, 500 people came to this dinner, many more to the private view. There he is um, in the uh, Le Tremblant restaurant, um, uh, bowing to everybody's uh, applause and congratulations. Uh, all the while, however, upstairs at his uh, hotel, George Dyer lay, uh, sat dead on the, on the loo in their hotel room. And um, this, he had died the night before of a, a, an overdose of alcohol and drugs. And Bacon, of course, knew this. Um, they had asked the proprietor of the hotel not to release the, you know, the body uh, until the day following this private view so that the all attention would be on the show instead of on George Dyer's death the hotel proprietor obliged, but here Bacon was acting throughout this night uh, of horror for him. Next. Uh, this is one of several triptychs that Bacon painted after George Dyer's death. Uh, together they represent a sustained and varied and really profound meditation on death, which is something that's actually rarely been done in 20th century art. Um, here in the two side panels, Dyer is seated and still alive. In the central panel, though, he assumes that kind of unstrung form, broken down uh, of death. And what's most striking to me about the central panel is that violet pool that has drained from his body. Uh, violet, of course, is a color that's often used to represent flowers. It has a fragrance. It is a warm color. Uh, but here, well, I mean, there's no heartbeat in that, uh, in that violet pool. It's a kind of implacable violet, a very fresh apprehension of death. Next. Uh, this is uh, Bacon with his, um, with John Edwards, his, uh, his, uh, uh, really his heir, uh, his, his kind of son. Edwards was a, a, uh, a charming rogue, 
a bit like Dyer in that way, East End Rogue, except that he was uh, a far more effective and efficient person in his way than Dyer was. He was on the make in a charming way. He had a very big smile that Bacon, as he grew old and melancholy, cherished. Next. So these are more uh, two self-portraits. Uh, Bacon, as, as I said earlier, his, as his friends died off, he said, oh, I only have myself to paint. Uh, he painted dozens of self-portraits, often very indicative of the mood of Bacon at the moment. So the one on the left is a 1972 uh, self-portrait, very contemplative, quite uh, sort of commanding, broad, assured brush strokes. He looks as if he is a figure lost in thought. Whereas on, in, in 1979, when Bacon painted the self-portrait on the right, it is truly frightening. A, a portrait of an aging queen, his lipstick smeared, his, his caked makeup falling off, uh, sort of a look of raggedness and despair about him in a way. Uh, it, at the moment that he was um, deeply unhappy about John Edwards, who we just saw, because uh, Edwards was establishing his independence from uh, Bacon. He would remain part of his life, but he wanted not to be totally defined as a companion of Bacon. And so at this moment, Bacon clearly felt, um, you know, very fragile and vulnerable. Next. And this is the last uh, known picture of Francis Bacon. Um, it's in the a bar in Barcock in Madrid. In 1987, he met the final man in his life, uh, Jose Capello, who was a Madrileño, very intelligent, smart, well-educated uh, professional. Um, they embarked on a sort of final love affair. Uh, at this point in 1992, Bacon had been told by his doctor he could no longer fly. Uh, despite the doctor's orders, he got on a plane in Easter, flew down to Madrid to meet up with Jose Capello. That, that this was a, a several nights before his, he was admitted to Clinica Rubier Hospital, where he died um, of uh, sort of heart, congestive heart failure and all sorts of other complications in uh, April of 1992. Next. This is Bacon's Farewell to the Ring, his last important painting. He almost certainly intended it to be his last painting. He knew he was dying. Um, he painted it, uh, he's often known, you know, as, as a person of shouts and screams and blood, but as Anglin was showing in, in those self-portraits, he was really um, just as good or just as interested in whispers and melancholy and in uh, uh, the paler aspects of life. Here you see the bull, Bacon loved the bullfight. Um, he did paintings of bullfights earlier in his career. Bull is a great symbol of classical power, pre-Christian power, great symbol of sacrifice too. Here you see the bull uh, almost in a, in a, in a, um, uh, as a messenger, a messenger of death coming to look at Bacon. And as you see, his, his horn is in the shape of a, of a um, sickle, which is an ancient symbol of mortality. Um, so with his death, I think that's where biographies end. So <laughs> we can, uh, I think we'll end the slideshow with that then. Mark? Yeah, I, I would sort of like to bring up just one other thing, Michael, that may, you may have questions about as well, which is the only thing that doesn't really emerge maybe as strongly as it might just from, because we're focusing on Bacon's art, is what an amazing character he was. You know, he was really an Oscar Wilde of his generation. And, you know, he, he had a complete, a, a public presence. He was so well known. He was so famous in his time. And he was such an actor uh, he'd been interested in acting when he was young. Uh, so there was that side of Bacon. It was difficult for us as biographers because, you know, going in, that's, the, that's the, the image every single person had of Francis Bacon. Um, and to, to an extent, it was even upsetting to people in the UK when we began to bring out these sort of other sides and aspects and nuances about Francis Bacon. Yeah, he could be, he could be very jolly. He was good, he was good fun. Uh, he, he said he woke up every day in an optimistic mood. Mm. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the great uh, challenge really was to turn him into a three-dimensional character where he had all these different aspects at once, you know, uh, that old E.M. Forster uh, observation that there are flat characters and round characters. We were in the business of making him round and to a remarkable degree that meant making, restoring the fun and the uh, kind of strange burning joy that he exhibited in his life 
Um, and also the whispers and the variety in his art, all these different elements. I mean, he was, he was a, uh, he was, he played many, many different roles, none of them false. I was just going to ask uh, why he destroyed so many paintings and, and what that says about him. I mean, for, you know, he could be a happy guy down on Dean Street, but, you know, he would come back and destroy these paintings, cut the faces out, you know, very violent um, actions in a way. What, what does that tell us about him? He loved to sacrifice his paintings, right? And yeah. you go ahead, you stuff. I'll start, but then, then, then you chime in. Um, you know, in, in a way, Bacon knew that he should have destroyed even more paintings. You know, he is, he has some of the most uh, brilliant paintings of the 20th century. He also has some very bad ones that left his studio. And the reason is that he would work just before shows in sort of a desperate concentration and focus of energy. Um, so it was, you know, Bacon knew that all of his art wasn't that great. And he lamented some of the paintings that did make it to market, including ones that he left behind in Tangier or left in uh, the basement of, of uh, Cromwell Place where he lived in the 50s. Um, so one could argue, oddly, that pro probably more destruction would have been better than less. Mark? Well, he, he also, he loved destroying his paintings. He took great pleasure in that. It was, uh, it was a kind of sacrifice that he, he, he did with, with great pleasure. Um, part of the reason that he had this trouble was that he was an autodidact. He was not trained as a painter. Uh, he hardly went to school, either art school or, or regular school. And like many autodidacts, he had, a, he had an invented artistic world with its own kind of rules, but he couldn't then depend upon training to make paintings work. They always had to happen almost by chance, he said. Uh, that was another important aspect of his sensibility. He insisted, he was a great gambler, of course, he insisted upon the primacy of chance. And so if the, if the chance didn't work, if the paint didn't gel, if it didn't, if he, uh, if he didn't, uh, if he didn't do it quite right, well, the hell with it. He would just cut it out and kill it and start again. You, you put that in your book very well. One person is there watching Bacon put this sort of splash of paint onto the canvas and realizes that if, it, if the splash had just gone any other way, it, yeah. would, it would ruin the painting. Um, right. and, and so uh, he was willing to take that chance as in, as in of course, gambling. Um, God, there's so much to, to ask you about him. I guess one thing that uh, I will ask is the, the Velazquez uh, popes, which um, you know, became formative in his career. What did they say about him? I mean, some people have said including um, Bacon himself, I think that he's not religious. But toward the end of the book, you quote someone as saying he was religious. And so here he was doing these popes. What did that say about him? Uh, go ahead, Alan. Yeah, go ahead. Well, he wasn't religious in an official sense. He was certainly no Christian, mm -hmm. um, but his, uh, you know, the opposite of a, of a religious person is not an atheist. It's a person who's indifferent, really. Mm. Uh, and Bacon was never indifferent to religion. He, he found in Christianity a, a source of a, a kind of fascination because he thought Christianity had failed. He mm. thought that it had not succeeded in its goals. Um, he thought that it was hypocritical. And it was part of the fatherly thing that he was always re re revolting against as well. But, that Velasquez was, a, he revered Velasquez, but Velasquez represented the old master tradition and certainly the Pope represented the big daddy tradition. So he was, he, he felt the failure of Western civilization after, the 20, after these wars and the Holocaust and other things. He felt the failure, failure very, very personally. And so he found ways to suggest that, to rip that mask off, one of which was the Pope and one of which, uh, was the very old master tradition, which in his work becomes a kind of beautiful, ragged remnant of old masterdom. Does, does that somehow lead to the, or explain the, um, the, the carcasses the, and, and, and the, the blood, the, the sort of awful uh, visual sights that, that he often goes for in his paintings? Um, uh, I know you speak early on about um, with surrealists who, who uh, themselves, you know, used images, the, the screaming mouths, et cetera. And Bacon took some of that. Was the rest of it sort of um, a reaction to the war or, or what? 
well, partly it was a reaction to the war, but you know, he he looked um, to Greek tragedy. I mean, that was a very, very important element in Bacon. You know, he was sort of unschooled, but what he did pick up was he was a voracious reader um, and died with something like 1,200 books in his, his uh, studio and bedsit. And one of the things he did during that period during the war that we talked about earlier, those two years, uh, he read a great deal of Aeschylus um, as the sort of most brutal of the uh, the early Greek tragedians. But you know, there it's life is life is what it is. You know, it is brutal. It is short and brutish. And uh, so a lot of that percolates through his work. You know, not just this sort of Christian thing, but this even earlier about you know the the, the problems with man and fate and things like that. And the other thing I'd like to say is one of his, his very good friends who was a, um, an art dealer said that, uh, once wrote an essay and she said, the very intensity of Bacon's disbelief uh, amounted to belief. You know, he was, he could not leave that knife edge. You know, he, he wanted to be there uh, dealing with the, the great tragedies, the great human condition. And that really drove a lot of his, you know, what he was about as an artist. Mm -hmm. He, he never really understood that when people said his paintings was violent, he, he said, well, I mean, look at what the world does. I mean, uh, he, and, he, and he said, you know, he was, he was identifying with the, the figures that were uh, tormented in his paintings. He was not himself tormenting them or acting in a violent way towards his figures. He was identifying with the wounded flesh, uh, which is a, a poignant thing. And, he, you know, he would also say, I mean, do people really read anymore? Because you look at what happens in, in Greek myths. I mean, my God, you think, you think Bacon's bad. You think he's Grand Guignol. Well, imagine having yourself chained to a rock and having your liver picked out every night for, <laughs> for you know, I mean, the, 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 the ancient world was, uh, was not squeamish about these things. And Bacon thought, well, neither should we be. Uh, uh, I, I, don't avert your eyes and, uh, and you know, go ahead. Yes, Anlin. No, no, I'm sorry, Mark. You just, uh, somehow you, you went out in the Zoom just to- It froze for a second, but you're yeah, fine. We, we were worried about you. Um, but I also want to end on, on another note too, which is, um, yes, Bacon was a, a truly important 20th century painter because he dealt with all of these different uh, elements, you know, the, not just the Grand Grignol, but tragedy. But he was also a very varied painter. And I think that is the thing that I would like to stress a little bit more because, you know, his portraits are just wonderful. And he painted later in life, uh, although he got a rather sort of slick and, and sort of grand in some of his final, uh, like particularly his triptychs, but he did some wonderful uh, late uh, landscape paintings. And so there, there was variety in there. You know, he wasn't just this one note Johnny that some people will say, oh my goodness, you know, he, he was this sacred monster and he painted, you know, these monstrous uh, paintings, but that's, that's not true. I mean, there's so much more to him than that. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Um, I don't want to uh, monopolize the, our the minutes that remain. Um, have have a few questions come in, um, Carolyn or someone? Do you want to uh, shoot these guys a couple of questions? Yeah. So we do have um, a few questions. Um, so first, I think it's very interesting um, that he expressed his sexuality so much in his art um, at a time where homosexuality was kind of scolded um, and looked down upon. Do you think that um, some of like his more deeper or sadder pieces, do you think that that kind of incorporates some of these feelings of his sexuality? Um, or do you think there's kind of another reason for those pieces? Here's the thing to say, I think, about that kind of thing, which is that interesting artists are never doing just one thing at once. They're doing many things at once. And they almost never want to be identified as, say, a female painter a homosexual painter. They want to be identified as a painter or as mm -hmm. an artist. They don't want to be ghettoized in that way. So many, many things are going on. Bacon did not usually directly address homosexuality uh, in his art. He did sometimes as he did in that, in, as in that 1953 painting, but you can feel it throughout in certain elusive ways. Uh, his, his theatricality, homosexuals often have to, in his day, had to perform. They had to adopt and assume roles. So the theatrical quality of his uh, of his art, the attack upon uh, austere, forbidding, moralizing authorities like the Pope, uh, 
you can feel the homosexuality in that. Uh, many, many different sort of complicated shadows come in, but a direct sort of, you know, attack on, uh, on, uh, on anti-homosexuality, that, that was sort of not what he was about. He was not ideological in that way. Very nice. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, what was, or what work of art was Bacon most proud of? Goodness, I don't think that he ever... Crucifixion, maybe? You know what? It was probably the uh, 62 crucifixion, uh, Mark, wouldn't you think? Because what he loved to do is even for his gal private gallery shows, uh, he wanted to top one with a great big, you know, blockbuster ending and that 62 crucifixion. And then there was a, a later, um, uh, a second version of his early three studies for figures at the base of crucifixion, which also capped one of his retrospectives. So probably Bacon would have been very proud of those paintings, but I don't think he singled them out as favorite children. Do you, Mark? No, he was, uh, he, his worldview was one that, I mean, if you, if you're, if you score, you're lucky, you know, you've hit on the roulette wheel and you've, you've, you've got a masterpiece, but the next day you might just be another, you know, schmucky painter. And so he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't, you know, he, he didn't, he was, he was very critical of other artists, but he was also intensely critical of himself. So he, you couldn't get him to admire his own work very easily. So I, I think the answer to the, uh, to the very good question is we don't really know. Okay, another question that we have. Um, Bacon's use of soft color and brush stroke are inevitably etched in the minds of the viewer. Was there a consistent use of any particular color or brush stroke throughout his career? <laughs> It's a, well, the, the easy answer to that is the Francis Bacon flaming orange. I mean, I think that if, if for anybody who only has a passing knowledge of Francis Bacon, uh, that flaming orange, which Mark showed in the 1944 painting, um, and then of course the, the deep saturated reds that you, know, you saw in the 62 crucifixion, um, those would be probably the most uh, consistent. But, you know, Francis Bacon, interestingly, brought uh, some of his early decorating ideas into his, his artwork. And it wasn't just those kind of the space frames that we talked about earlier. It was also a palette. You know, he used a very, very unconventional sort of cool grays and blues. And uh, Mark showed you that violet. I mean, he took real chances on color. So it's, it's uh, you know, in a way it's unfair to say, ah, the bacon orange. But of course that's the, that's the one key you know, yeah. color that everybody remembers. But, you know, right after the bacon orange, he went into a very monochromatic, quiet, whispery period, like that painting of the poor fellow with the ear. Um, so he, he changed visually quite a lot, much more than people recognize over time. And in terms of his brush stroke, you know, he was a true, Venetian, uh, in the sense that uh, not a, not didn't have the Florentine outlook. He 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 was not interested in drawing. He was not interested in capturing flesh in a in a net of line. Uh, the flesh had to awaken by uh, a sort of magic chance uh, and somehow be alive, not kind of laid down like an illustration, but alive. So his his breaststroke, I think, was fairly consistent over time in the sense that he he wanted it to to suggest flesh without trapping it. Um, and that was a Venetian you know, quality. Is there time to say a word about uh, his friendship with Lucian Freud? I mean, speaking of the fleshiness of the paint uh, and the degree to which their friendship uh, really affected each of their work. Okay, do you see any influence of his early furniture and rug design work in his later creative work? I, let me, I just wonder if there's anything we can say about, about Lucian Freud and Bacon, their friendship and the influence that each had on the other? Oh, yes, Mark, why don't you uh, answer that right after this? But I think um, to that question, uh, partly we, we talked about how he used the design elements from his early um, design career, and that went throughout his whole um, you know, painting career once he became a, a painter. Um, an interesting fact that we discovered was that he, like commercial artists, had a T-square in his studio for just sort of squaring up, you know, of framing so that you would get something in, in the center of, of your, your painting. Um, and then, you know, all of those, uh, he painted 
uh, divans, you know, that, that the, these like little or settees that people would be sitting on. And you would have some incongruous moments in Francis Bacon's painting between quite bloody bodies. And then they were in this sort of tasteful environment. So yeah. that's another one of the wonderful disconnects that you get in Francis Bacon's paintings that, that you go, woo, you know, sort of pulls you up short. So I think that's the answer to that question. And then, Mark, do you want to? Well, yeah, Bacon, Bacon was a painter of rooms always. You know, he was not an outdoors kind of guy. Uh, he was inside the room of, the, you know, that the room head. Um, so there's a lot of design there. In terms of Freud, um, well, uh, they were very useful to each other for a period of, I guess, maybe 25 years. And I think, I think there's many, many things you can say about that, but I think the most important one, rather than uh, literal or visual influences, I don't think Freud had much influence on Bacon uh, that way, but their friendship was very important. I think they gave each other courage. Uh, uh, it's very important for an artist who's, who's breaking lots of rules and misbehaving in a variety of ways, artistic and personal, to have someone uh, to talk to about it. And they didn't talk about it in any meaningful sense. That would be way too corny. But they, they would go out together and, and a, a friend, a mutual friend said, there was nothing more obnoxious really in London than to see Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon out together because <laughs> they were so dominating. They were so superior. They knew everything. But that was no doubt obnoxious. But at the same time, um, they were able to talk to each other in a way that sort of egged the, each egged the other on and each uh, felt seen in a way, and it respected. Freud said about Bacon that he was the Freud said about Bacon that he was the bravest man he had ever met. It's and also, I think so it's, you know, it's a matter of courage, really. Lovely. And also, you know, there is a direct um, influence from Bacon upon Freud because at the moment, you know, Freud in the early days was still doing these sort of Nord, Nordic, very you know, very linear. Uh, drawings and paintings. And so Bacon helped him bust out, you know, and, ba and, and Freud sort of acknowledged that. And, and, and there was this, uh, there was this wonderful friendship until such moment that Freud began to uh, become more popular. And then, then there was little jealousy entered in there. And that eventually brought the end of that wonderful artistic collaboration, personal collaboration. Um. Just one more quick thing I wanted to quote. You, know, you, you quoted uh, art dealer Helen Lathor as saying that Francis was not the same shape uh, as any other human being. There was a sense of an aura about him, something radiant. Um, and it's, it, I, I get that from reading your book. He, I, I have, you know, share that sense of vicariously of going into uh, the, the, the uh, Soho bars and having him be greeted so warmly and having him order champagne for everyone. Um, he must have just been a wonderful man to, to know. And, and I guess writing his biography is the, the next closest thing. I think we would have loved to have, have uh, been with him, that's for sure. Um, yeah. You know, there's all, the one thing I think we regret is that we never met him um, because, you know, just, just seeing somebody and their body language for, for, uh, on your own for yourself is so important. But, you know, we did the next best thing we could, which is go everywhere he ever went <laughs> and interview everybody that we could find in our effort to get to the essential bacon. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Okay, so we are at <laughs> six o'clock. So I just want to quickly switch gears and ask one last question for each of you. Um, just a quick response of other than Francis Bacon revelations. What are you each reading right now? Well, I'm reading uh, Jim Atlas, a, a very good friend, wrote a book called The, the uh, Shadow in the Garden. And it's a sort of his life story that also has a lot to do with, with uh, autobiogra autobiographical and memoir writing. So I'm teaching it in my current class and rereading it. I'm reading a biography of Carlton Watkins, who was the uh, great American photographer from the 19th century of the West, which is another interest I have. Uh, very different from Francis Bacon. And um, I hope you'll sympathize with me when I say this, but I have been reading for the last two weeks, the Bacon book. <laughs> Please do not have another book to offer <clears throat> that I'm reading. I am planning to get to the sheltering sky 
because I've never read it. I, I just happened upon it in the bookstore. And um, of course, uh, uh, it's, it's territory that, that Bacon knew well. So that intrigues me. All great suggestions. Thank you to Annalyn, Mark, and Michael for joining us tonight. This was such a great hour and we all really enjoyed your discussion. Don't right. forget to purchase a copy of Francis Bacon Revelations. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, don't forget that the links are sent in the chat for easy purchases. So visit there to go purchase your copy. And thank you all. Have a great rest of your night. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye.